Wisconsin Music Podcast. What do you feel is oppressing the local scene from getting to where it should be? This is not exclusive to Wisconsin or Milwaukee. I live in Milwaukee. Okay. This is kind of universal. There's not nearly enough diversity on the bandstand or in the club. And I think that is suffocating. I really do. There's not nearly enough diversity. And I, as a band leader, feel some responsibility for that, right? I think we need diversity in the music, sexual orientation. We need more women in jazz. We need it. I was fortunate to play with quite a few women and make records with quite a few women now. Here to introduce you to the great musicians and music businesses and organizations of Wisconsin. Every week, Wisconsin Music Podcast will be bringing you great information on what's happening in the Wisconsin music world. For our music-loving listeners, we'll bring you music that you haven't even heard of yet from unique and talented artists and hear about their journey so far. You'll either hear live performances of their songs or songs from their selected discography. For our musicians out there wondering what they can do to further their recognition, we'll be calling upon Wisconsin music businesses and organizations to enlighten you on what they're doing to help further your music journey. And now, here's your host, Zach. Hello. Thanks, Dean. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Wisconsin Music Podcast. This week, we have Professor Russ Johnson. Russ is the Associate Professor of Jazz at University of Wisconsin Parkside. I'm going to read this off of his bio. He has seven recordings as a leader or co-leader and performed on more than 75 recordings as a sideman. Russ has worked alongside many of legendary figures in jazz, including Lee Konitz, Steve Swallow, Bill Frizzle, and Joe Lovato. In addition, he has recorded and or performed with a long list of the most prominent musicians currently on the international jazz scene, including Myra Melford, Ken Vandermark, and Tony Malavi. Russ has performed in more than 40 countries across the globe. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. My pleasure. My pleasure. Why don't we start with your musical origin story? All right. Well, that'll take an hour. Um... <laughs> Uh, I had I had an older brother who played the trumpet. He was five years older than I was. And when I was in fifth grade, he just said, so you're going to play the trumpet? And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, and I mean, I kind of messed around on his horn a little bit, but he basically said, no, you're going to be a trumpet player. You know, it's you, you, you don't have a choice. And he was quite a bit bigger than I was and he used to let me know that he was quite a bit bigger than I was. So. <laughs> physically so i basically it was kind of decided for me and so i started playing in fifth grade like most people you know started in the band program one of the advantages is my brother played pretty well he wasn't like phenomenal player by any means i had a good representation of what the instrument should sound like okay. from, a fairly, from a fairly young age and i think that's crucial you know most beginners when you're starting out it's just kind of you're just you know this search and destroy mission to try and make some notes sound especially on a brass instrument anyway he he kind of put me on the path and 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 i took to it and and i really kind of loved it right away and like even in my elementary school like i wanted to start a jazz band there was no elementary school jazz band like it was you know the, yeah. but, there was a, but there was like a vibraphone teacher uh, i went to frat elementary and received there was a, a vibraphone a, i think he was a science teacher if memory serves mr jones and he, he played vibraphones like we played go tell it on the mountain in a jazz like you know in a jazz way in an assembly when i was in like fifth or sixth grade or something so okay. uh so that was it and then you know the typical path middle school um high school i had one very fortunate break though my brother studied with the legendary trumpet teacher uh, brass teacher in the southeast in southeastern wisconsin named johnny hemkis okay yeah yeah and i mean he's he's a legendary teacher and back in that at that point this is late 70s early 80s uh Johnny didn't take any students until they were in 10th grade. That was just his rule. And my brother, when he was a junior, so that would have put me in like seventh grade, uh, when he was a junior in high school, said he knew he wasn't going to go on to being a musician. He said, you know, Johnny, you should hear my kid brother. He sounds pretty good. And Johnny was like, I don't take anybody until they're 10th grade. And, and my brother kept badgering him. And, and, and Johnny was like, all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll hear him. And so I alternated. Johnny heard me and liked what he heard. And, and I alternated lessons starting uh, with my brother starting in seventh grade, which is three years before most people got to study with John. So I was extremely Extremely, extremely fortunate. Uh, he's a legendary teacher for a reason. He was an incredible brass teacher, incredible human being too. And yeah, it, it, it made all the difference in the world just as far as concept of sound. And then out of high school, I mean, I, like I went, to, I went to a Jamie Abersole jazz camp when I was 16, and that's where what I where I really got into the music. I tell a story all the time. I was they, they had a record store in the basement room of of this jazz camp in this college, and um, Adam Nussbaum, the great drummer, was standing over my shoulder, and I was nervous because I'd seen this guy play and the night before, and I was like. 
wow, he's, you know, this incredible musician. And he said to me, hey, kid, what do you play? And I said, I play the trumpet. He's like, you got to have these four records. And it was Miles Davis working, steaming, cooking, and relaxing. The classic records on the Prestige label from 56 and 57. And when I got home and put those records on, my life was changed. Like, literally, I was 16 and my parents never had to tell me to practice ever again. Like, I was in. I was hooked. Yeah, those records just, like, I mean, it was Miles' sound. It was the vibe of the band, too, but it was Miles' sound. It just... It totally sucked me in. And, and so I, yeah, from then on, I was, I was kind of hooked. Listening to Miles, which four albums were those? They were work, uh, working with the Miles Davis Quintet, steaming with the Miles Davis Quintet, cooking with the Miles Davis Quintet, relaxing with the Miles Davis Quintet. So the story behind those four records is Miles was being pursued by Columbia Records. And in order to, to sign with Columbia, he had to fulfill his deal with Prestige. So the quintet went, and that's the band with John Coltrane, Red Garland, Paul Chambers, and, and Philly Joe Jones. They went into the studio and basically recorded everything they knew. And they were able to make four records in a couple of sessions. And that's how Miles gave Prestige and said, here you go, I'm done. So he can sign with Columbia gotcha. and, you know, make you know, 10 times the money, basically. So, yeah, so those those records, you know, and then, you know, my brother had Kind of Blue and Sketches of Spain and stuff, those records. So I was kind of familiar with Miles beforehand, but those those records are what really, really pulled me in. And then, like I said, I was kind of hooked. I wanted to go to school. Uh, I wanted to go to Berkeley in Boston. I didn't have the money right away. I was saving money. Uh, I actually went to Parkside for a year under the tutelage of Tim Bell, which was amazing because he was an incredible big band director. Just I, I learned a ton from him. And then I went to Berkeley and then ran out of money again, you know, dropped out of school, got a gig on a cruise ship when I was 20. I floated around for a couple of years. And then I moved to New York uh, just before I turned 23. I and mean, I was in New York. That's so that was 1988. And I was in New York from 1988 until 2011. Wow. Yeah. And it was, as most players, when you move to New York, unless you're the, the chosen one beforehand, you do a little bit of everything. So like, you know, I was playing in salsa cumbia bands. I was playing in wedding bands. I was playing Italian fests. I was playing some really great jazz gigs, but I was playing, yeah, I was, I was just trying to make my living. I was doing some Broadway subbing and stuff like that. So it's just one of those things where, you know, it's kind of a, it's almost a right of passage for brass players in in new york or especially you know doing the the salsa and, and, and cumbia bands and, and you know i was not familiar with that music at all i'm a white boy from racine wisconsin i heard that music <laughs> I, I couldn't i couldn't find beat one to save my life on my first gig <laughs> until you know it was you know luckily the lead trumpet player could tell that i could play the instrument but didn't have any clue of the music he he like you know he was like yeah well you think uh Beat one is that's actually beat four. The bass player, boom, boom, ding, ding, four, one, ding, right? Anyway, so. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, but then I, 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 you know, I was in New York for 23 years and I had the opportunity to uh, play with some really incredible musicians, some very famous, some not so famous, uh, but equally incredible. I used to tour a ton. I, I, I For a period from 19, probably 97 to 2008, 2010, I would spend at least four months out of every year in Europe touring. Yeah, it was it was really kind of an amazing time. And I was part of, I felt like I was part of an amazing community of musicians in New York at that time. Yeah. In 20, 2010, Tim Bell retired at Parkside. And um, I knew my father didn't have much time left. And so when I originally applied for the job, uh, it was a temporary thing. And it allowed me to spend some, I knew it would, if I got the job, it would allow me to spend some time with my, with my father before he passed. So I applied for the job and then I commuted from New York <laughs> to Milwaukee for a year and a half. I'd fly into Milwaukee on Monday night. I'd teach all day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, th and I'd catch the last flight back to New York on Thursday night. I'd spend the weekend with my family, but I was still playing a ton. And, and yeah, I was playing in New York all the time on the weekend. So it was pretty, pretty crazy. And then Parkside offered me the, you know, the tenure track full-time position. So then I moved my family here in, in 2011. Play in Chicago a lot. Um, play with a lot of incredible musicians. Play in Mo Milwaukee fairly regularly. There's some amazing musicians here as well so that's kind of my story cool you went to frat for for elementary school where did you go for middle school and high school uh, I went to uh, McKinley Junior High and then uh, Park High School and there's there's kind of a lineage of trumpet players from Park High School yeah uh, Jamie Brevik went there Eric Jacobson went there there are a lot of cats that can play the trumpet and, and a lot of that has to do with again with Johnny Hempkis. Uh, you know I, I don't I think one of those guys studied with Johnny and the other one didn't or not regularly but yeah there's kind of a lineage of, of trumpet players from from Park High School and, and so yeah I mean it's yeah I went to Park I went to Park and, and that was that was awesome that's that's where I graduated from as well Eric Moronis uh, I don't know if you know who that is. He he studied with Kurt as I did, and he was only one or two years ahead of me. Yeah, there's a lot of great players have come out of 
southeastern Wisconsin and Wisconsin in general. You as well. <laughs> well, thank you. I actually studied with Kurt for a while too. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. When I was really getting into, into improvisation, Johnny was more of a trumpet teacher than an improvisation teacher. But I was real when I once I got into really you know wanting to become a jazz musician, I studied with Kurt as well, and that was also hugely helpful. Hugely helpful. Great player, and he definitely knows his stuff. Yep. Great teacher as well. Did you gig much in Wisconsin before you went to New York? I left, I mean, y- yeah, some, but not a ton. I mean, I left, I really left Wisconsin when I was 19. I might not have even turn quite turn 19. Yeah, I just turned 19. So, I mean, I was playing some, but it wasn't, it wasn't a ton. I remember my very first gig, though. <laughs> it, was, it was a supper club on Browns Lake, and I don't remember the band leader, but I remember there was a, a vocalist, and you know, she got in touch with me and said, I really love to play Body and Soul. And I said, okay, cool, I'll learn Body and Soul. So I learned Body and Soul, which is typically in D-flat. And she was like, okay, Body and Soul in A, and I couldn't play at all. <laughs> I couldn't play it in D-flat, let alone play it right. in A. You know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know I, learned, I learned, oh, yeah, not every tune is in the key that's in the book. You know, I played some. But it wasn't like I was I was playing a ton. I was I was pretty young when I left. You know, when I went to Berkeley, I was nineteen, and and you know, and then after that, I wasn't really back much from nineteen eighty six, eighty five, eighty six until twenty eleven. And have you done gigs in Wisconsin? I know you said you you're in Chicago a lot, but are you doing any in Wisconsin? Well, pre COVID, sure. And I was uh, you know playing the the estate fairly regularly. I was playing with some musicians in Madison. Honestly, not as much as I'd like. Okay. I was playing more in Chicago. Uh, which, I, believe me, I'm thrilled to be playing in Chicago a lot. And part of that is is honestly because of the aesthetic that I have, what I want from music, and, and I think what musicians are appealed, maybe appealed to my playing, who might may like my playing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I, and I don't think I'm a carbon copy of, of anybody. And, and I think in Chicago, I mean, and I'll say it like a bunch of the musicians in Chicago knew who I was. This sounds totally conceited, but I'm on a lot of records and I play with a lot of famous people and, and, and there are musicians in Chicago that knew who I was. So when I moved back, I kind of stepped into a really good scene scene there you know yeah. and i was i was wanted and they wanted me to be me rather than having me be you know whatever right they're they're hiring you to be you they're not hiring you to be somebody else exactly so what do you find like the top three things that is best for a working musician okay so i have it limited down to two rule number one you got to be a bad motherfucker Right. There's so many great players. You have to be a great player. Yeah. That's that's kind of a given. And and some people are willing to take care of that and some people aren't. So you gotta be a bad motherfucker. That's rule number one. And number two is you gotta be cool. And that's it. Honestly, I think those two things are crucial. And being cool in, encompasses a lot of different things, right? It's not just being a nice guy or being friendly. It's being on time. It's being prepared, having your stuff together. I mean, so you could put a lot under, you could get rules, you know, your three, yeah. four, five right. fall under that. Be cool. And being cool means, you know, in every situation, in every musical situation, one thing that I try and do is I try and play to the absolute best of my ability, regardless of the situation, right? Right. It might be a gig that, that, you know, doesn't, you know, whatever. Some people might think it doesn't matter or people are messing around, and I refuse to do that. And I won't name names, but I, no. shortly after I moved back, I was asked to do a, a gig at the estate, and it was going to be a rehearsal. And the pianist um, showed up. And my, my time is precious, man. I, you know, I have family besides this this career and a full time teaching gig. Right, I'm teaching full time on the jazz studies professor at UW Parkside, and you know, I made it in my schedule. I was like, okay, cool. We all agreed on the time, and the piano player showed up like a half an hour late. You know, and it's just it's and it's not even that it's disrespectful. It's just kind of like, oh, whatever. It's cool. It's not cool. And no. I think I got that. I, I got that from from New York because in New York, there's no time to do anything. So you're lucky to get a rehearsal. And I mean, the only time people really, the only time the vast majority of musicians are later. Are or if they le- legitimately get stuck on the train or something, right? Because everybody's pouring their heart and soul into the music, right? Right. So if, you know, it is it is disrespectful, right, to the other mu- musicians not to be on time and stuff like that. So, like I said, I mean, there's, you know, being cool, being a great player is rule number one, right? And that means, honestly, that's what means sometimes saying no to things too and not things that you don't think you're the right player for. There are things that I do very well 
there are also some things that I don't do very well. And I think there are other players that probably do that better. Now, if it's a band that's going to work on some stuff and it's a weakness of mine that I'm willing and they're willing to let me work my way through it, I'm willing to address that weakness. I love addressing those weaknesses and I want that opportunity. But like if, it, if it's a one-off gig and it's, you know, yeah, it's if it's a one-off gig and there's somebody that we would be better for it, I, I don't want to take a gig that, that I'm not really equipped to play well. I like to play well and I think I do play well. Right. But it's, but we all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that, uh, like I said, that it kind of boils down to those two things, right? Right. Be, uh, be a great player and be cool. And that's, that's really the bottom line. Right. And right. being cool is a lot of different things. There's a lot of different elements that go into being cool. Those two things, definitely be cool and don't waste people's time mm -hmm. and know your stuff before you walk up on that bandstand. That is something that, again, I take great pride in. Even if it's a gig that would be considered inconsequential, it'll be very rare to hear me go on a bandstand and not be prepared. Right. And I do that for every single gig I do. But again, I typically play with a lot of really great musicians and I don't want to be the weak link, but I don't want to not know that tune or not have that rhythmic concept together or not know what to play in that setting. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, and plus, I mean, it's just a general pride thing. I take pride in playing my ass off as often as I can. Take care of business before you get on stage. Yes, exactly. What kind of red flags have you witnessed that might be helpful to people listening, future musicians or musicians now that they wouldn't think of that you think are pretty dangerous red flags going into gigs? Red flags, just like things to avoid, avoid or you went oh i kind of had a feeling that this was not going to be a good gig because of whatever and i should have listened to myself right <laughs> we've all had those <laughs> yeah um i rarely take gigs with people that i don't know right now that's not always everybody's position right. i have a full, i have a full-time teaching gig you know when i was in new york i did everything right. i took everything especially when i first got there for the first eight to ten years you take whatever comes in and there's something and i can tell a story about that that's 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 really kind of important about how that can further your career yeah go for it yeah it, at this point I'll, I'll just tell you like at this point it's rare that i'll that i'll take a gig unless i know somebody that's in, uh, on the gig that i trust that says yeah this is cool but i'll say this that's where i am now i'm 55 years old if i were 25 that would not be the case so for the 25 and this goes with being prepared and, and being cool this is probably Probably now about 15 years ago I'm in New York, I got called from a guy to do a recording session and the money was light. It wasn't what it should be, but there were really great players doing it. And I was kind of shocked. Like he said, well, you know, Cameron Brown is playing bass on this and uh, a dr great drummer named Farona Clough, who's kind of like a legendary, like avant-garde free jazz drummer. I'm whatever, I hate those terms, but <laughs> Jay Hogard on Vibes, it was like filled with great players in the band, right? Yeah. And I was like, well, damn, if they're doing it, I'm going to do it, right? right? Even though I thought the money was light. So they obviously knew something that I didn't know about this guy. I knew not, I hadn't heard his name before. I hadn't, didn't know anything about him. So I did this recording for him and it was cool. And the money was what he said. And it was, it was fine. And, you know, he looked almost kind of like a homeless guy. And um, I later found out that he had moved to Los Angeles and became this huge film scoring guy. Oh, wow. So now probably eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. So this was probably 15 years ago. I, I hadn't heard from the guy and this, this is maybe longer than that. I hadn't heard from the guy in probably eight years, right? Never heard yeah. back. Um, it was just a gig. You did the recording session in one night. You do it, you, you're done. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. Hey, Russ, my name's Stephen Trask. I don't know if you know who I am. And I'm you know, going through my, my, as we used to say, mental Rolodex, trying to figure out who he was. He goes, but you did this film score for me, whatever, 10 years ago. And, and I'm now in LA and, I'm, and I'm, I'm writing for this major feature film. And I need you to come in, to fly into LA and do the, play the, the trumpet solos in this movie. All right. So literally, and I was, <laughs> I was on tour in Europe when this call happened. And I flew from Zurich to Chicago to Los Angeles, got into Los Angeles at whatever, 11 o'clock at night. And I had to be in the report and, and I can't remember what, one of the big sound stages, was it on Fox? Anyway, it's an 80 piece orchestra, right? It's the full on Hollywood thing. Okay. And it was for a movie called The Little Fockers. So if you've ever seen the movie The Little Fockers, I yeah. play all the trumpet so I play all the trumpet solos in the movie. Oh, okay. And so the, the moral of the story is this guy who I didn't know, if, you know when he first called me and I and, and you know, he didn't appear to be this, you know, 
whatever figure, this you know guy who's going to end up being a superstar, a few years later was now this big film scoring guy in Los Angeles. And he wanted me because he played for the producers of the film. He, they, they heard my sound. He's like, this is what I need for this. You know, like every time Robert De Niro comes on the stage, he's the god fucker, right? Terrible. Anyway, uh, whenever he comes on, I play this, this theme. Right. Okay. And, the, and the producer was like, yeah, anyway, long story short, I do this recording session and I made a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. This is why you're always cool and you always play your ass off, even if it's something that you don't think is going to be valuable in the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. I made for two days and I still get residual checks from that. I get checks every year yeah. that, that help help you know pay for my whatever you know my Christmas fun. It's like this guy. I I could have kind of mailed it in. I could have said no. I easily could have said no because the the money wasn't right. 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 But I did the gig and I played well enough that I ended up doing this one other thing for him. And I made you know I made like probably now by this point over thirty grand for two days in the studio. Nice. Playing Very on nice. this one movie, you know, he paid. They paid me triple scale. <laughs> I mean, just like you know, and, and all the Hollywood legendary figures are in this this orchestra, right? It's yeah. like the full on, you know, it's a full on thing. So the moral of the story is that's one one of the, one of those when I say you know, be a bad mofo and be cool. Like it would have been easy for me to not take that gig or mail it in, and I didn't, and it ended up paying off very handsomely down the road. Yeah. So as far as red flags, what I would say is, depending on where you are in your career, if you're a young musician, take whatever comes in. Right. Right. The experience will be, in, you'll learn something from the experience anyway. One, you know, if you establish yourself, I do think it's important to say no to certain things too. I really think it's important to say no to certain things or have a have a money number. Right. Yeah. Now, I'll just I'll just tell you, like, if if at this point, if the music is great, I'm in. I don't care what it pays. Right. If the music is great. Yeah. But if it's not something I don't love to do, then I have a number that I have to get. And if you're not going to come up with that number, then I'm not I'm going to say no to it because. Again, I don't want to be a drag on the bandstand. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be a dick. I want to be like happy to be there and play and play well, you know, and I'm still learning. I'll, I'll say this about the business, you know, the business side of this stuff. And it's changing all the time too. This, this is ever evolving. The, the business of music is ever evolving. Yeah. So I'm still, I still make mistakes and I still once in a while say yes to something that I should have said no to. And sometimes I probably say no to some things I should have said yes to. So as far as red flags, depend, I think those depend on where you are in your career. Yeah. When you're, if you're a young musician, if you're just getting out there, say yes to everything. Right. That experience will be invaluable. And then you'll learn what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And so and then when it comes time to it, if it's something you don't want to do, say no. Yeah, that's great advice. Like you said, when you're younger, you can take a lot more chances because you're not you don't know a lot yet. But once you start getting to different bandstands, working with different people, you start figuring things out quickly. Or, or if you don't figure things out quickly, you're not going to be there very long. Exactly. One hundred percent. So. Pre-COVID, you've done some gigs in Wisconsin, like you said. What do you notice that gigs in Wisconsin compared to New York, Chicago, Europe? Are there certain things that are the same and there are certain things that are different, obviously? What kind of things stand out to you that are different and the same? First of all, there are great players in all those places you mentioned. There are great players in Wisconsin. I mean, world-class players, without a doubt. World-class players in all of those places. The only thing that I would say is different, if you if like living in New York, is I would say depth, right? If... And again, in, in New York, the scene is so broad that you find you, you really find your niche. Like, this is what I do, and I get called to do this. Gotcha. And in, in Wisconsin, the jazz community is not as, as I want to say, musically diverse, right? What, what I did in New York doesn't really exist much in Wisconsin, just as far as like the stuff that I was asked to do. I can play the trumpet very well, so I was asked to play really hard music. Yeah. Hard music with and I'm, you know, pretty decent at dealing with odd and mixed meters. And, you know, I worked very hard to do that. And I would be called to play that kind of music. Now, that kind of music doesn't exist nearly as often. It might occasionally um, in Wisconsin, but it's not part of the scene where in New York there was that there was a scene for that. So that's what that's how it's different. And like in Chicago, I kind of gravitate towards that kind of thing, right? There's more of that in Chicago than there is in Wisconsin. There there are incredible players in Wisconsin, remarkable players who do like, especially like like in a straight ahead jazz thing, who do that a lot better than I do, 
Okay. That was my thing when I was younger. Starting at around 27, 28, I realized that wasn't going to be where I was going to make my living, where I wasn't going to be making my mark as a musician. So I had to play to my strengths. And it doesn't mean I love any one music more than any other, man. I, you know, I put on a, a Charles Mingus record and I'm the happiest dude <laughs> around, right? Yeah. I put on a, a, like I still listen to Charlie Parker all the time and I get goosebumps. It's just so incredible. They're just different. They're different scenes. Scenes, right mm -hmm. and the thing is in new york there's all of those scenes just because there's eight million people there eight hundred thousand i mean you know that's kind of like just the law of laws of nature and it's not a, a diss against anybody and it's you know it doesn't make new york better it's just different like i said there are world-class players in wisconsin that could go to new york and have right and done very well you know can play on a world-class level it's it's one of those things where the the difference to me is finding your music finding your niche finding where you fit in so and, and that's just that's just different and that's different in denver and in seattle and in san francisco and los angeles and austin and all these different cities mm -hmm. anywhere you go and there are incredible players. I mean, I, tr I travel a lot in Europe. Um, I've been to like 40, 45 different countries, right? But um, including like globally, but there, there are fantastic players everywhere and all over the States, right? And there's some, you'll walk into a club in some small town and you hear just a young musician, he or she's just playing their ass off and you're just going like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, you could make it anywhere. And it's right. true. It's, it's totally true, right? There's, there, you know, like I said, there are ridiculous musicians all over the place so it's really just a different for me it's a difference in scenes right more of them because it's 10 times as large if you had 10 milwaukee's then you kind of you're getting close to <laughs> that'd be five million so we'd still be we need we need 15 to 8 17 milwaukee's and then you got new york and then you would have all these different scenes so it's the one thing i'll say musically that's different like in new york rhythm sections play different they play much more on top of the beat in New York. It's a generalization. Is it because everybody's in a rush in New York? Kind of. It's that has something to do with it. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not bullshitting you. That there's yeah. something. There's something to do with it, right? And there's an energy. It's survival, man. I mean, you know, you know, it's yeah, it's survival. But rhythm sections, I think, play differently in New York. And part of that is just because they're exposed to all these different things. And and what I mean by that, and specifically, is your time and your time feel. Right. And this goes for horn players, too. If you don't have great time in New York, you're never going to play ever because there are thousands of cats that can play that have great time. And rhythm sections do not want to play with horn players that don't have great time. <laughs> I mean, you could play, you could have the slickest lines and the most beautiful sound in the world. But if your time isn't happening and like in New York, that's like a separator, man. The, the cats that, that, that play in New York that make a name for themselves in New York have great time. And that's the thing that separates New York from like all the other places in the world. Like in Europe, a lot of the music they play doesn't have that straight driving energetic time. It's a different concept. And, and it's not, and again, it's not better. It's just different. But in New York, that's the one thing that I would say that is that is different than than all the other places. And, and like I said, and there are great players everywhere with great time everywhere. <laughs> you know? Yeah, of course. That, that's a, a generalization. I mean, that's great information for especially up and coming musicians to know that, yeah, Wisconsin has great musicians and you can play with them and, you know, be successful. But you can also go other places if you have the desire and the push to make your talent succeed, then you can almost anywhere if, if you have the drive. Yes, yes. And you do need the drive. I'm going to be 100% serious. You have to have that drive. If you're just thinking about it, no. <laughs> it's got to be your all-consuming passion. I'm talking about if you want to play, work as a jazz musician and pretty much any genre on a world-class level, yeah, it's got to be all-consuming. Hours a day spent working on your craft. Absolutely. There's no way around it. If you don't practice, if you don't work on your craft, if you don't improve every day, then what are you doing? Yep, yep. Is there certain venues that have treated you really well compared to other ones that have treated you poorly that you want to talk about? Well, I love playing at the estate. I'm not going to lie. I love playing at the jazz estate in Milwaukee. Part of that is the sound of the room. From the stage to the, the opposite wall is what? Seven feet? Ten maybe. feet? Yeah, maybe. Not a lot of depth there. It's not a lot of depth there. But it, for horn players, and I'm talking about myself as a horn player, being a trumpet player, that works because I get enough love from the room. It bounces back to me kind of quickly. Yeah. So there's not a delay in that thing. So I love playing the estate. The Sugar Maple, which is on Lincoln, and they're not having music much anymore, even uh, right before COVID, but they had a, a, a small back room in uh, at the Sugar Maple, which is one of the best beer bars. If you're a beer drinker, they have everything. And they're open 
open now, um, socially distanced. But they have a back room, and there's a club in New York in, in Brooklyn called Barbez. I used, I lived a couple of blocks from Barbez. It was one, like one of my favorite rooms to play in New York. This tiny little club, and the back room of the Sugar Maple has that vibe. I mean, it might hold 35, 40 people, and I like playing those spaces. I like playing in weird locations. I really do. I mean, I like playing nice clubs too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but like I, I did the uh, uh, Bayview Jazz Fest one time and they put me into a room that was like a fish farm or something. But it was mm. awesome. It was awesome. I can't remember the name of the venue. This is six or seven years ago, maybe even longer, 10 years ago. And so I like playing in weird spaces. I like playing small places. I like playing galleries, art galleries. And, you know, you're you're not going to make a ton of money at those places. No. But... but they're, you know, for me, the acoustics and the vibe of the room matters, right? Like, I was fortunate enough to do a few gigs with uh, Devin Drobka's trio with John Christensen at Boone and Crockett in Milwaukee okay. on, a Monday, on a Monday night. And the vibe of the room is so good. The bartenders are great. It's just like it's conducive to making great music. For me, oftentimes, it's not, it's not the prestige of the room. It's how, does, how, how the room sounds has a huge impact on me. Um, gotcha. The way I play, I do... I try and, and, and mess with my tonal color a lot. I try and be very versatile. So it's not just lines. It's about how I can affect my sound in certain ways. So if I can really hear myself well, I love playing there. I don't care if it's in you know my office or, you know, if it's in your your office or wherever. It's, yeah. you know, the sound of the room, you know, has a huge impact. But I mean, as far as other venues like Cafe Coda in, in, in Madison is fantastic. That's a really great room. And also the, the Arts and Lit Lab is now moving to... Uh, to a new space and then they were moving to that right before COVID hit. It's called the art arts in lit lab in Madison. And they were doing Now they're doing different venues, but like those guys have good ears. They know what sounds good. And like, you know, like I said, I like playing small little weird places. I, that that's, I play with some really famous people in some small little weird places. So, or, or large weird places, but it, you know, it's re- really the acoustics have a lot to do with it. For me. Yeah. Interesting how much your sound and your tone changes from room to room. Yep. For sure. What do you feel is oppressing the local scene from to where it should be? This is not exclusive to Wisconsin or Milwaukee. I live in Milwaukee. Okay. This is kind of universal. There's not nearly enough diversity on the bandstand or in the club. And I think that is suffocating. I really do. There's not nearly enough diversity. And I, as a band leader, feel some responsibility for that, right? I think we need diversity in the music, sexual orientation. We need more women in jazz. We need it. I was fortunate to play with quite a few women and make records with quite a few women band leaders in New York. And the fact that women are underrepresented and, you know, racially the bandstand seems to be segregated often, I think that's completely oppressive in so many ways and a lot of people are afraid to talk about it i'm not afraid to talk about it at all you shouldn't have to be no no exactly and also in ideology as well and that's a large topic that we're bringing up but in many places there are the musicians that are accepted as being established as being the superstars and if those superstars carry too much weight and if definition of what is good music is narrow that can really strangle a scene one thing that i'm really happy about in milwaukee is in the last 10 years, I think the scene has grown tremendously. And I think there are very specific musicians who are really helpful in that. I think Devin Drobka, moving back, was a huge help with that, right? Devin takes chances. Jamie Brevik takes a lot of chances with his music. He's got this trio case that's phenomenal with electronics, right? Mm-hmm. So it's for me, the things, I love so much different music. And and I love different music. It, and because I love one thing doesn't mean I don't love another thing. And that's oftentimes kind of a mistake I think people make. Yep. I think, oh, if you like this, then you don't like that. Exactly. I can listen to Louis Armstrong all day and be blown away. I sound nothing like Louis Armstrong, right? Mm-hmm. I can listen to Miles or Freddie Hubbard, or I can listen to, you know, whatever. Name your favorite players of today. Peter Evans, Ralph Alessi. I mean, there's countless. Uh, Ambrose, Akamusuri. I mean, there's so many. Rid- Nicholas Payton. There's ridiculous players. Tr- I'm speaking of trumpet players now, right? Yeah. Uh, there's there are ridiculous players that are playing different musics, and I use that in a plural. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes in scenes, there there can be this hierarchy placed on this is good because so and so who is a superstar does it. Yeah. Right? And that is dangerous. I really feel it's dangerous. 
because my music doesn't sound like player next to me or the player next to me on the other side. Like there's some heavy trumpet players in Milwaukee. Like, I think I think Eric Jacobson and, and Jamie Brevik, and there are others, Sam Newfeld. They're, they're just great trumpet players in this area. And I don't sound anything like them. And the beautiful thing is like with those cats, I feel no vibe. They get it. They get that. I don't want to sound like them. They don't mm-hmm. really want to sound like me either. But there's a respect there for like, man, you can play. And so, I mean, and I try and hold myself to this standard all the time. One little piece of advice I can give, and this goes for anybody experiencing any art, it's not just music. If you go into it with preconceptions of what you want from that experience, you're only going to be disappointed. I'm going to say it again. If you go in expecting to hear this player sound like this, or this artist to paint like this, or this poet to compose their poetry like this. You're going into it with your expectations rather than gaining what the artist is trying to present, right? And yeah. this, is, this is very unhealthy, and I've been guilty of it in the past, and, I, and I'm working hard not to, to have that be part of my nature. And it's in our nature to say, oh, this is good, oh, that sucks. Bullshit, that is complete bullshit. It doesn't suck, it just may not be what you want to hear. And there are players, I, I know there are players, that don't like my playing. And that's okay. And I mean it. I mean this. I'm totally okay with that yeah. because I'm okay with my playing and enough people are that I know I've done something right, you know? So I, and I remember, and again, I won't name names, going to hear a saxophonist and I'm not even going to give the city who everybody heralded as this incredible player or not everybody. Some did. And some people thought he was a charlatan, thought he was a complete bullshitter. And especially when you, when it comes to improvised music and things like that, I think the guy is remarkable. Like truly remarkable, but it was I didn't re- figure that out for myself until I stopped putting my expectations on what I wanted to hear rather than listening to what he or she was presenting. And, and again, this goes for all art, mm-hmm. all art. Yeah, it's it's you know I didn't figure that shit out till I was forty five years old. <laughs> I really, really, and I figured that out on my own, kind of like, I just remember going to hear some music and everybody was raving about it. And I was like, I don't really like, and it's okay. You don't have to like everything. No, of course not. You know, keep, you know, if there are things that you need for music, go listen to music that that fulfills those needs, but just don't dismiss things that don't necessarily fit your aesthetic because yeah, that can, you can come off in a very negative light if you do that. Yeah. I think people generalize way too often instead of taking the time to listen to what they're hearing or observing and going, okay, I don't care what everybody else thinks. It's what I think about this that really important to me because this is my life. This is how I want to experience life. So if I like it, I like it. If I don't, I don't and I and move on. You don't have to go on social media and tell 800 people what you do and do not like. I, I couldn't agree more. I could. And, and very few people, I mean, we're all, we're all prisoners to the idea of popularity. Right. What do you think is bringing the local scene better into the limelight? What's what's raising it out of the the shadows, basically? Well, I mean, I got to hand it to the cats that used to be part of the conservatory, East Milwaukee Jazz Institute. What they are doing, I think, is incredible. They are exposing this music to a younger generation. This music comes from a tradition. We can't deny that tradition. No. Black American music. Mm -hmm. This is when I when I was talking about things that are oppressive. This. I think is is a middle-aged white man. I need to, and we need to acknowledge the history of this music and where it comes from. And I think there are people in the community that are doing that. Like I said, there are amazing players in Milwaukee and in, in all over the state. I mean, I know Milwaukee and Madison more than other places, probably because they're the largest cities and they have jazz clubs. But I mean, there's some incredible musicians up at Lawrence and Appleton. Holy cow. I mean, ridiculously great musicians up there. I think what they're doing, I think it's Milwaukee Jazz Institute. Yep. What they're doing is extremely admirable. I think they're really making con- a concerted effort to get this music out into the world, right? And the thing is, when people hear it, they actually like it. It's just most people aren't exposed to it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, most people just don't hear it. I teach a jazz appreciation class at UW Parkside. It's a gen ed music class. I've got 65 students in there. And four of them are music majors and 61 are not. And I love it. That's great. It's a gen ed class. And most people are like, I mean, the comments I get all the time are like, wow, I never knew I liked this. Or, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Like, this is really awesome. You know, and some people are just like, yeah, I hate it. And I was like, yeah, I don't like that music either. I just like this, you know, anyway. Right. Um, you know, but I mean, I, like I said, there are so many music, musicians that I admire in the, in, in the community. And I just, I'm, I'm impressed by people that are willing to educate. I don't want to say educate the public because that, that puts it on a, a hierarchical plane. I don't want it to be on that. That are willing to turn people on to the music. 
right? And right. There, are the, there are those people in Wisconsin for sure. Late 90s, I was coming back at a band that was uh, on, uh, called the Other Quartet that was on Knitting Factory label in New York, which was an avant-garde jazz label. And I had people that were total heroes that were willing to book the band, right? Those mm -hmm. people are heroes. The people that run Arts and Lit Lab are heroes. The people that run the estate in Cafe Coda and any jazz club, those people are heroes. They're not going to make a ton of money. They believe in the art, right? Right. Those, those people that, that have that host that house concert, they're heroes. They really are. The people that come to the shows are heroes. Like, yeah. we all, you know, I mean, and it's, you know, fortunately when I play at the estate is especially as a leader, it's pretty packed. It's pretty crowded in there. Most times that I play at the estate and that's a beautiful thing. And Milwaukee is so fortunate to have a club like that. Hopefully mm -hmm. post, -COVID, post COVID it's still there. So anyway, it's, those people are all heroes. Those are all the, you know, as, as much as anybody, the arts presenters and stuff like that. I did a thing at St. Kate's. It was really interesting, uh, which is, I think it's called St. Kate Art, St. Kate's Arts Hotel, not too far from the Fireside Forum in Milwaukee. And they had, there was an art curator there. They have an art gallery. And they're doing a photography exhibit. And they had this photographer come in and he had all these, these um, photos that were, basically he, he based them off of, of the titles off of Steve Lacey, who's a soprano saxophonist, like his tune titles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they had me come in and improvise. They videotaped it. They had me come in and solo trumpet improvise to these photographs and they were in sequences. And I mean, like that kind of experience for me is fantastic. And then they, that, that show ran for like a month and a half where people could come in they're staying at this fancy hotel they come into the art gallery and you hear a trumpet player improvising to the 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 photographs that are on the wall that stuff's amazing yeah and, and there are people that appreciate art everywhere from the smallest town to the largest city those like i said those people those people are champions those people are heroes you know those people that are willing to actually also put their money where their mouth is that's why i, I appreciate club owners so much they're willing yeah. to, to to bring people in to play music and it's awesome and hopefully i'm helping them out because hopefully i'm bringing enough crowd that they're making money too i had you send me four songs i haven't had a chance to listen to them yet but okay why don't we talk what i like to do on the podcast is that the guest talks about the song and then i implement the song and then we move on so we can just take some time right now and you can explain the behind each one of those songs and then i can put edit and do post-production on all that stuff great so um there are two that are a pair that that go into each other okay one will say transition johnson and then the tune fjord okay those two are the transition is a is a, a link into the tune fjord so those two should be played together back to back okay i'll do that i released a record called headlands a couple of years ago and i think you might have been at one of those shows actually didn't you come up to the estate was that the one with the guy from new york uh, yeah yeah so the, the the music is that those the reason those two are together is that's part of a suite Okay. It's, it's a, it's, there are no starts and stops in the suite. I just put track marks in just for potential radio play. Gotcha. I didn't want to put any track marks in. It's a 55 minute suite of music. It should be one, it's one really long through composed piece. That's how I perceived it. Now there are tunes inside that. Right. So, um, so Fjord is, a uh, is in all the tunes have titles relating to water or rocks and water. Um, that's why it's called headlands. Um, so transition, and it's got my last name attached to it, and then Fjord, those should go together. Those should be played together. Okay. Uh, so that was – so the way I, I structured the piece is there were um, solo improvisations interspersed throughout the 55-minute set. I had my moment. The pianist had his moment. Bass player, drummer each had their moments, right? Mm -hmm. um, so – but they, they serve as links between the tunes, Right. So we're coming out of a tune. There might not even be a head out or a melody out on that tune. It might just fall into the solo. And then that solo is just basically going to create these transitions between two pieces. Right. So and they can it's fully improvised. They can do whatever they want, but they they give the cue to for the band to move on to the next piece. Gotcha. Right. So that that's those two those two pieces. And they should be played back to back. That's it's really one tune. OK. Uh, of a part, much larger, uh, a much larger suite. Okay. 
personnel is Rob Clearfield, who's now living in Paris, keyboard, Matt Eulery on bass, and John Deitemeyer on drums, incredible musicians from Chicago. Remarkable. Rob moved to Paris a, a year ago, two years ago. So that's Headlands. Um, and then I, I basically, I, I gave you one tune from each of my last three records. Okay. Uh, the record before that, uh, you can play, it was a tune called Lithosphere, another rock title. And then the, the tune Lithosphere, when I first moved to the Midwest after being in New York for so long, I put a quartet together with an incredible bass clarinet player named Jason Stein in Chicago. And then the drummer is Tim Daisy, who's one of my closest friends and a ridiculously great musician, uh, and Anton Hatwich on bass. And that was the first project that I recorded after move, after leaving New York. And that's kind of a rock tune. You know, the section, the improvised sections, the way I, the way I compose, a lot of pieces have open sections, but then hopefully there's kind of these seamless transitions into a new section. In the case of Headlands, it's into a new tune, but in Lithosphere, it's into the different solos. So we're not always playing on very strict solo forms. Sometimes we are, but sometimes we're not and then the musicians have to create these transitions between the sections of the piece i love this idea and i, I love playing like that personally so it's my band so i get to do it so that's lithosphere <laughs>
So those gotcha. are the, the tunes that I gave you, and they're and I think they're I gave you one basically one tune from each of my last few recordings. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. As we are wrapping this up, what are you looking forward to when COVID is no longer a threat? I miss the hang, man. I miss the hang. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a non-musician and you're listening to that, it's I miss hanging out with my friends that are musicians. I miss hanging out in the, at the club, possibly having a drink afterwards with all the musicians that might be there listening. Yep. I desperately miss this sense of community. You know, and the thing is, like, I would go to the estate regularly when I was not playing because – my friends hung out there. So I miss the hang. So I can't wait to just get into a club with all the other musicians and to be able to hug them again. Jazz musicians give each other the jazz hug all the time. You know, and who knows if we'll ever go back to that, man. Handshaking may be done forever. But I, I look forward to that. I really look forward to that. The sense of community. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, I'm a jazz musician. And it's in all genres of music. The sense of community. The hang is everything, right? I learn just as much from the hang as I do from the bandstand. Just talking to great musicians about music in person is remarkable. And like yeah. I said, I learn as much from that as I do from listening to them play. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man, I can't wait to hang. I can't wait, you know, can't wait to go to a, a nice dinner. I mean, I still get a nice dinner now and then, but like, right. take out the same. No. So, so yeah, that's it. I want, I want to hang, you know, with my friends in Milwaukee, with my friends in Madison, with my friends in Chicago. I get back to New York pretty regularly. I still have a house a couple hours outside of New York City. I want to go and hang out with my friends and hopefully hear some musicians that are, everybody's going to be itching to play right everybody yeah. gonna be you know i'm dying man i just i miss performing all right you can practice all you want it's not the same no because you bounce ideas off each other you you get energy from being up on that stage from the audience and the people you're playing with it's it's a completely different atmosphere completely different experience yes 100 yeah. percent. and that's that's you know yeah that's what i miss that's what i'm gonna that's what i'm gonna do when that when when this is lifted i'm gonna hang out every night for a while <laughs> You know, until I until I've caught up with my friends. <laughs> yeah, of course. One of the last questions I ask is work life balance. How are you balancing? Obviously, with COVID, we're mostly staying at home. Or at least most people are. For you, pre COVID, post COVID, how are you balancing your work life with your home life? You know, that's a great question, and it's a challenge. I'm not going to lie, because I have a full time teaching gig. Uh, I'm busy, right? And I play a lot, so it's a challenge now. I have an unbelievable wife who gets it. She's a musician as well. She's a singer songwriter, great songwriter, great singer. She's a vocal coach here. In, we live in Shorewood, the north side of Milwaukee, and she's an amazing musician. So I'm fortunate and she gets it. And she's we've been together for a long time. We've been married for 25 years, right? So she understands it. Uh, I have a daughter who's getting ready. Uh, she's in her senior year, so we're looking at colleges and we're mm -hmm. dealing with all that. My daughter's very understanding. What I'll say is this. When I'm home, I'm home, right? When I'm home and, and when I'm with them, I do everything I can to not be distracted by my other life my work life. Right. And that goes back to when, when, like when my daughter was very small, it, when, you know, when she was little, I was on the road all, all the time, man. Mm. like four or five months. But when I was home, man, I would take her everywhere. I would do every drop off at every event. I would be there to pick her up. I would be there, you know, kid seat in the back of my bike. I rode my bike a bunch in Brooklyn back then. And, and I'd have her like in the back, back seat or I'd take her to gigs so it's, I mean, that's really a great question. Uh, um, for me, I'm very fortunate and my wife is incredibly understanding. And because she's a musician, she can hang. She knows what that's about, you know. Like in, in, in New York, I used to go, when she was hanging out with her her rock musician friends, I'd do that hang instead of the jazz musician <laughs> hang. You know, it was a different vibe. But yeah. but uh, so she she can hang. So it's it's a tough balance. But the, the one thing I'll say is like, when I'm in my music, I'm in my music. And when I'm home, I try and be as available as I can. But it's a tough balance. Yep. And, you know, it's, I mean, now obviously I'm not touring at all because of COVID. But up, up, up until then, like I was, last year I was in New in Europe three times in China once. Even though I'm living in Wisconsin, not in New York anymore, I'm still touring fairly regularly. Yeah. You have to have people that understand it. You really do. And I'm very, very, very fortunate in that. Regard. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. When I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm home, unless I'm doing this, I'm home. I'm hanging out with my family. I'm that's that's what I do because you got to have a balance arise. Things aren't as smooth as they can be if you don't do something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, I know a lot of people that have very rocky relationships because of not being able to separate the two. Right, exactly. And, and like you said, it's difficult if you can find a way to do it, which sounds like you did. It makes everything a lot easier. 
Yep. Yep, for sure. Well, Russ, I really appreciate you being here on Wisconsin Music Podcast. This was a great interview. There's a lot of information that you have given the listeners, especially musicians that are coming up and starting out and even ones that have some years behind them. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure, man. Really my pleasure. Great talking with you. You have good questions too. That makes I've done a lot of these. When when somebody knows what they're doing in the, you know, in the interview chair, it makes it a lot easier. So thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated for that compliment. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Interview with Russ Johnson. Very cool guy. Very talented musician. I hope you got some great insight from what he talked about over the last hour on the podcast. Let's do our thank yous before we do the last song from Russ that will play us out. Of course, we want to thank Nate Wyckoff of Frequency Farm Recordings in Wisconsin for creating the podcast theme music. Shout out to Dean Bundy for our voiceover at the beginning. Thanks to our sponsor, ZTF Studio. They're located at ztfstudio.com. Zach is a professional mixing and recording engineer, and he is looking forward to working with you. So contact him through his website or at ztfstudio at gmail.com or call him at 262-757-8120. Have a great week, everyone, and I'll see you next time. The last tune is Hat and Beard, which is off of Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch, and it's dedicated to Thelonious Monk. I did a record. If, if you look at my discography, I play almost almost exclusively my original compositions. But I did a record. <laughs> it's a long story. I was asked to present a record in New York at Merkin Hall. They had a series where they asked an artist to present a record that they loved in its entirety, right? So they asked me, the curator actually asked me to do Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch. I loved that record. I knew that record like the back of my hand. So I said, sure, I would love to do that. You know, it's a big, huge concert hall in new york tons of press all you know whatever it's a big deal right. and uh, so I, I had a, the chance to do that and then a record label a european record label approached me about recording it and i was very hesitant i mean that's music is iconic to me right it's a, a, a desert island disc for me gotcha. so like i didn't really you know like the idea of recording somebody else's record over again was really kind of off-putting but i ended up doing it and i'm mean, honestly i'm very happy with the results all of the rip material is exactly how i transcribed it from the dolphy the original dolphy recordings it may be some mistakes in there don't hold me to it but i transcribed them to the best of my ability but the improvisation sections are all treated very differently than they were and i actually used a slightly different instrumentation that was on the dolphy recording so that that tune is hat and beard and like i said it's you know it's it's dolphy's composition dedication to monk Polonius monk but it's the arrangement is kind of mine but the material is all dolphy's like straight up transcription of that (laughs) 